Imagine you wake up one morning in your Geneva apartment and you notice the first symptoms of a disease that everyone in your neighborhood knows too well. And you're suddenly so itchy, you don't sleep, and you have to scratch yourself with anything you can find in your kitchen. And your skin starts to change too. And you go to the doctor next morning, but there's no cure. And you're being told that research in this area is not a priority. And this sounds um, uh, very crazy, but you know already that uh, people around you uh, have the same symptoms. And you know that soon you will have worms under your skin. You will soon have shadows in your field of vision because they live in your eyes too. And in a few years, you will be blind. And this sounds like a horror movie, but it's the reality for millions of people in Africa. And I'm talking about river blindness. It goes by its scientific name, onchocerciasis, and it is the second leading cause of infection-induced blindness worldwide. And this on the right-hand side, or left-hand side, is Etienne Kasaku. And I met him a while ago in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And he's a fisherman from the eastern region of the DRC. And next to him is his father, Germain. And a few years ago, Germain's eyesight started to deteriorate. And now he only can see light and dark. This is what they call a mouth without hands as he cannot contribute to the family's income anymore. And this is a very devastating situation for him. And his son Etienne is only 37. He already has problems with his eyes. And when he's out fishing, which is practically every day, then the 10-year-old son Marco takes care of the grandfather instead of going to school. And this is how they make ends meet. And this vicious cycle is very hard to break. And both Etienne and Germain know too well what will happen to Marco in the future. Before I explain how we plan to break this vicious cycle, I will give you a few useful facts about neglected tropical diseases. In short, NTDs, just to make my life easier over the next minutes. And uh, there's 21 entities on the priority list of the World Health Organization. And they are neglected, but that does not mean that they are rare. It's actually the opposite. More than one billion people are affected from one or more entities. And that is one out of five in the world's population. And you probably have never even heard of them. They are called Leishmaniasis, Chagas disease, myositoma, and many others. And existing treatments are either outdated, toxic, not available, uh, not, not adapted to the patient's needs. In some cases, there's no treatments at all. And because NTDs affect the poorest communities in the world, there's little financial incentive to develop better medicines. And I'm a biologist, and I sound a bit crazy now, but let me tell you that parasites actually are really fascinating. A parasitic lifestyle means to eat at the table of another, and this is an extraordinary successful strategy in evolution. In fact, 40% of all animal species worldwide are parasites. Many are important for biodiversity patterns, but others can induce severe diseases, such as river blindness. And river blindness is caused by tiny worms that are spread through the bites of black flies. And black flies, they live near the rivers and they feed on the blood of animals. And I've, during my trips to Congo, I've experienced how you're swarmed by the black flies the closer you get to the river. But this is what you have to do when you're a fisherman or you take care of your coffee plants. So when a black fly bites a human, then they transfer these worms into the body. And once under the skin, they can grow into adults. They can grow up to 80 centimeters in length. And they live in these nodules under your skin. And then they do what every creature does to survive. They mate and they produce new young worms. And these young worms move through your skin just to make themselves available for the new black fly to be taken up and transported to the next human. 
but for, uh, uh, for people, this leads them to scratch themselves all day long with whatever they, they can find. And I've even heard about men who were heating up their machetes in the fire and then applying it to their skin just to look for relief. And there is a drug that could actually help Etienne. It is called ivermectin, and you may recall it from the pandemic. And um, ivermectin is um, given very frequently to the patients because the problem is that Etienne lives in a very remote area in the DRC. And even if he could travel for hours to get to the nearest pharmacy, even if he would have the money to pay for it, it would not be available in the local pharmacies. So healthcare workers and community volunteers, they go to schools, they uh, visit places where other people gather, and they give ivermectin to everyone in the community every year to everyone at the same time, regardless of whether they are infected or not. And this is what we call mass drug administration. And it's a good way to reduce the parasite burden across the community. But if people like Etienne and Gemma are not around in their day because they live too far away, then they miss the drug. And this will induce further damage because they need to wait another year and this will induce further damage to their eyes and to their um, uh, relief of symptoms. But mass drug administration has been a very successful program to reduce the disease burden worldwide. And there's this statue in front of the WHO headquarters here in Geneva that celebrates this success. But despite decades of hard work, river blindness is far from being eliminated. And you still have entire villages devastated by the disease. So this statue is not history, it is today. And we still have elders being guided by their kids through the villages, and the kids are very likely to be infected, and then if untreated, they will become blind. And they will become blind because some of these worms end up in your eyes, and this is, um, for the parasite, it's a dead end, because there's no black fly being able to take up the, the worms from the eyes, but for these little kids, or for Etienne, this is catastrophic, as these worms will die eventually in the eye, and it is the human re immune response that reacts to these worms, and then will lead to the damage in the eye. And if you do not treat it, then you will become permanently blind. And the problem with ivermectin is that it does not um, cure the patient, it only kills the young larvae, but it does not kill the adult worms. And it also does not protect you from new infections. So the communities basically have to treat very frequently with ivermectin, and they have to do that for at least 10 to 15 years, if not more. But many patients, like Gemma and Etienne, they fall through this net because they have to work or they are just too far away. In an ideal world, we would have medicines that can cure the patients, that would be available everywhere and whenever needed. So this is why I dedicated my professional life to find new medicines for these neglected tropical diseases. And one thing I learned was when studying parasite how incredibly difficult it is to find molecules to develop and deliver medicines in these very complex diseases. And you start with a molecule that acts on the parasite. It either kills the parasite or it um, starves it. And to find these mo molecules, uh, we collaborate with very different partners, for example, with pharma companies, and they have millions of such molecules in their libraries. And they, make and make these, they open these libraries to us, but to test all these molecules takes time and money, 
And this is something that we rarely have in these underfunded areas. So for worm infections, we tried something different. For, um, to, to start with, interestingly, uh, we have to have um, a molecule, as I said, and in, we actually have more uh, drug treatments for animals available than we have for humans. And this is a situation that we used. So our strategy is basically to identify veterinary registered drugs see whether they could work potentially for human parasites. And this is called drug repurposing. And um, this is a good strategy to save time and money and move forward with confidence because we have already, we know that these drugs are working in animals. And with this way, we can shortcut the first part of a drug development process. So we evaluate the dose needed in humans. We test them in healthy volunteers, just to ensure that they are safe. And then we need to test them on patients infected with river blindness. And this means that we need to set up clinical trials where the patients live. And to this, we, um, we work in very remote areas. So you have to bring the laboratory equipment, the medical equipment, into these areas to make these studies possible. And we will also work very closely with the local health authorities to, um, yeah, to base on their knowledge on the disease and also bring the knowledge on uh, these strict procedures and requirements that we have when you want to approve a drug. At the same time, we also need their knowledge to understand the local environment because uh, at the end of the day, we need to bring the drug to the communities and also have the patient accepting them. And just to give you a short example that all these efforts that we do in strong collaborations with many, many partners, that this actually will have an impact, is an example on a disease that is called sleeping sickness. It is also called human African trypanosomiasis, and it is a devastating disease in endemic in Africa. Symptoms are neurological based. You have psychosis, you have aggressive behavior, and also sleep disruption. But more importantly is that if you're untreated, almost every patient will die. And for a long time, the only treatment available was an arsenic injection that was so toxic, it killed one in 20 patients. And it's also so caustic that you need to use glass syringes instead of plastic ones because it would melt the plastic ones. And now imagine having to be injected with it. And the patients call it fire in the veins. And together with our partners, and in this case it was really many partners, we have developed a drug called Fexinidazole. It's a very simple tablet that is safe. You take it for 10 days and you're cured. And this is a revolution for sleeping sickness. And here is a young boy, Brinol, who has taken Fexinidazole last year at his house and not in the hospital. And he's cured and he's fine today. And my hope is that we can replicate this success for river blindness. And as we did for sleeping sickness, that we will find good molecules, that we find good partners and funders to make this possible. And I hope that in a few years, that people like Gemma and Etienne can go to the pharmacy when they're diagnosed with onchocerciasis, and they will hear, sure, here's a drug for you, Take it and you'll be okay in a few weeks. And it will only cost them a few cents or it will be for free. And they will be cured. <laughs>